Welcome to episode 3 of the Beatbox Session. This is the only Beatbox podcast on YouTube. Although, uh, I'm, I'm just claiming that, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> you can double check on that and, uh, I, I, it's just a label. <laughs> anyway, in this episode, I want to talk about the rise and fall of hip hop. So, we're going to take a look at hip hop specifically rap music and overall the hip hop culture and its rise, its peak and its its fall, its its downfall from my own opinion mixed with the the historical aspect of it. So you know what? We're going to also do a little bit of a uh, beatboxing too in terms of uh, you know we're going to take a look at some beats, some classic hip hop beats over the years, you know. So let's begin right freaking now Said a hip hop, the hippie to the hippie to the hip hip papa, you know, stop a rocket to the bang bang boogie, say up top the boogie to the rhythm and the boogie to beat. Oh, what you say is not a test of a rapid to the. <laughs> <laughs> Had to kick it off with a little bit of a, a little bit of rapper's delight. We're gonna go to the early '80s. <laughs> Broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stations like they just don't care. It's Grandmaster Flash and, and the message. Party people, party people, get funky. Hit me now, get funky. So Sonic Force, just hit me. So funny. So Party don't stop it, party don't stop. Hip it a hop it and da 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 da. Oh my God, what happened to Africa Bombada? <laughs> oh my goodness, what a downfall! You want to talk about hip hop's downfall? You want to talk about? I mean, somebody just completely taking a nosedive and just getting exposed for all the wrong reasons. Somebody just getting, just falling from grace. Africa Bombada. I don't want to start it off with, with such a negative, like, dark story. But, I mean, that's where hip-hop came from. You know, Africa Bombada. I mean, Bam is one of the most influential uh, 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 icons of, of hip-hop. He's one of the pioneers. He's, he's a legend. His music throughout the early 80s and, and his, uh, you know, the, the whole electro funk, you know, that style of music and his his influence in the hip-hop community, it's no joke. You know what I mean? Like Rakim said, I ain't no joke. I mean, Africa Bambara, and then to find out the allegations, the sexual abuse, right? These young men coming forward, now they're older men, you know, they're, they're adults in their 50s and, you know... They've become pretty much senior citizens, and Africa Babada, he's he's old as he's old as dirt now. You know what I mean? But this guy got away with allegedly molesting and raping young boys. He was a pedophile, Africa Bambada, and this guy was an icon. I looked up to this guy. I mean, I just I, I liked his music when I was younger, as a teenager. I would listen to that. 
when I got into the b-boying uh, culture and b-boy music in early 80s uh, 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 hip-hop music you know electric boogaloo and all that and electro funk and you know I mean he was the rapper Africa Bambada was that dude who made records about like peace, love, and unity. You know what I mean? When it came to hip-hop. He made like positive hip-hop records. Peace, love, unity, you know. Bringing the hip-hop, you know, bringing the black community together in the East Coast. Specifically the, the street gangs. And, and bringing, it, bringing them together. Underneath this, uh, his, uh, oh my god. Uh, it's, it, it, it was so shady, you know, the whole thing. It's like finding out the, the whole Bill Cosby thing. Bill Cosby, you know, this alleged rapist of women. And then Africa Bambada, this, this rapist of young boys. Again, I hate to start it off with such a dark, such a vile, disgusting, uh, horrible horrible story but um, again hip-hop's roots is, is Afri Africa Bombada back in the day and it turned out that he was raping boys way back in the day you know I know it's nauseating but that really that really made me sick to my stomach I couldn't I couldn't almost believe it it was like oh my god man you know what I mean because what happened was you have this guy you have Africa Bombada and he was, I believe he was a gang leader back in the day. This was all according to, like, K KRS-One, who is a hi hip-hop historian in his own way. You know, he's, he's a legend. Uh, another guy who's a legend, KRS-One, and he was there when hip-hop was born, basically. And, you, you know, you got Africa Bam, uh, Bambada, and he... He was the gang leader but then he started bringing the street gangs together in in the east coast and then he became like a positive role model you know he would take some boys under his wing young young men street kids some of them take them under his wing they would you know they would be under the same roof and sometimes bam would abuse allegedly these these young men teenage boys and he would take advantage of them you know what i mean he would sexually molest them and that's real messed up. So that's definitely one of the darker roots and the darker stories in hip hop. You know what I mean? That's something that's just so, so messed up. But we're going to go even further back in, in hip hop history because hip hop is a beautiful culture in and of itself. It's, it's brought so much uh, positive positivity despite all the negative stuff that came along with it too. We're going to take a look back back in the 60s in the 1960s i believe there was a there was an artist i think his name was pigmeat markham this pigmeat and he was kind of a he was like a comedian spoken word kind of guy but anyway he had a song that was kind of like a rapping kind of lyrics you know what i mean the, the way that he would flow on on the song da 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 but da da but da ba da ba da ba and that was kind of like the late 60s type of uh, I guess you could call it proto rap proto rap p r o t o which is like not rap specifically called but it was like what rap would become or, or some kind of uh, early version of uh, what rap music would become so he had that flow that cadence of ba da ba ba da ba 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 da ba da ba da ba da ba that kind of rhythmic speaking kind of like one of the uh, you know the, the the poets the lost poets and rap music is very interesting too because and then when, when, when we get to the early 1970s and admittedly I gotta say the 70s and me and the 80s of course 70s and 80s as a hip-hop head I know very little about those eras compared to the later generations the, the later decades because I number one I was born in 87 so I wasn't there you know what I mean I wasn't there to to hear all that noise um, but in the early 1970s I mean you had D, D, the DJ uh, uh, DJ Cool Herc cool, cool Herc in the early 70s is, is credited as the guy that brought hip hop to the United States and he was credited as the one who 
birthed hip hop, the 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 father of hip hop. I mean, DJ Cool Herc, I believe, was from Jamaica, so hip hop has Jamaican roots, and but then it it came out of the East Coast, you know, the the East Coast African American community, you know, yeah, places like the Bronx, you know, so that's where early hip hop began. And DJ Cool Herc was the one that was spinning. He was spinning records. He was he was doing the DJ thing that the Jamaicans would do. But he would th there was also the MCing aspect of it, which was MCing was toasting. It has its roots in toasting as well. Toasting was basically. I mean, I, I've only seen very few, very limited toasting footage on on the internet. And I think those go as far back as the, the early 1980s. And it's basically just a bunch of vocalists. They would get on the microphone. There would be some DJ playing a record in the background. And he would be, he, he would be toasting in front of an audience. So you have this audience inside a club or inside some kind of, uh, you know, it's like a party atmosphere kind of thing. And then you have the toaster who would, he, he would shout out and he, he would basically just... I don't even know how to describe it. He would just be talking somehow. He would be talking rhythmically or some kind of uh, some kind of on beat kind of talking. And so, in some ways, the MC, the the modern day rapper, kind of has its roots in in Jamaican toasting, where it's like, yes, yes, y'all, and you don't stop to the beat, y'all, and you don't stop. You know, the guy would take the microphone and and do the shout outs and everything. You know, kind of like a like a hype man, you know. Yes, yes, y'all, and you don't stop to the beat, y'all, and you don't stop. And one thing that I love about the the hi history of hip hop is how it it changed sonically over the years too. Like in the nineteen seventies, there's a few records here and there. Like you have uh, the song, um, I believe it's a "Walk This Way." Walk this way. The rapping style of the 1970s was a little bit different. It was a lot more basic. It was a lot more just... It, it, it wasn't a complicated thing. They would just basically rhyme the last word in the freaking sentence. So it'd be like, da-da-da-da-da-da, bam, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, bam. So it'd be like, I was walking down the road, and then there was a girl. She was really pretty, and she rocked my world. I mean, that was very basic, you know what I'm saying? Rapper's Delight, very simplistic rap song, but, but a classic late 70s hip-hop song, you know what I'm saying, by, by the Sugar Hill Gang. Awesome beat, still a classic, and that has, you, you can hear the disco roots, you can hear the, the funky disco vibe roots of that joint. You know, the, the, the good times, you know, good times. It has that sample or some kind of uh yeah like a sample that boom 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 but a boom boom it has a bit of a disco -y vibe to it and then by the early 80s it started started to sound a little bit more electronic the the electro influence and that You know, and then th that sonic sound, that kind of electronic futuristic sound, it, that would that would morph over the years, that would influence Miami. So now you're going from from the East Coast into the, I guess you could call it the Southern area, just the the Miami area, and they would influence uh, the Miami rap style, which is a uh, Miami bass. Miami bass has a little bit of that electro sound to it. Uh, and it was very dance clubby kind of music in in the uh, Miami area. So you got the Florida you know, hip hop taking over Florida by the late late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties. I think maybe even mid eighties, mid eighties, mid late eighties. Uh, Miami bass. And as far as hip hop itself, I mean, we and there was also the four elements of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So now we're getting into the early mid eighties. You got the, the the influence of uh, graffiti, b-boying, which is break dancing, breaking. You know the art of breaking, the the dance art form, which evolved from 
from African dancing and people getting into a circle. Like, I've seen footage on YouTube where it's like from the 1950s, late 1950s, you know, maybe 1960s, where it was basically these African, uh, not even an African tribe, but it's just these African, like, little groups of African people. And they would just be gathered in a circle and some, some guy would be dancing in the middle and he would be doing flips and break dancey type of moves and this is like late 50s to the early 1970s you know what I mean just right and then by the early 70s you had the, the break dancing thing that kind of took over the the the, the hip hop community you know what I mean so black folks started doing the breaking the b-boying by the 70s and then back in the day back in the 1970s from what I understand it was just it was just funky beats. It was funky beats like like, like uh, James Brown type of music. So you have somebody like DJ Cool Herc. He would be sp spinning a, a James Brown uh, James Brown record, but he would focus on the break aspect of the song. So in in a song there would be a break. A break is basically a moment in a in one of those songs, especially like a James Brown or something like that, where it has a nice dancey beat to it it's it's very danceable very funky and it's not necessarily the 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 slow melodic part of the song it's just it's more of a in a funky come on and it would just loop over and over again so somebody like DJ Cool Herc would just loop it loop it and he would loop it over and over again and that would become the 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 music for these b-boys and these breakers that would dance to that 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 type of music that's why they call them breakers break dancers uh because they dance to the break beat the break beat would be come on uh, you know like a james brown record and that would get looped over and over again so that has its roots in the 1970s, but going as far back as, I mean, who knows how long the, the Africans have been doing it, the 1950s, 60s, where they would gather around in a circle and they would, you know, the, the African uh, dancers, they would they would dance in the middle of the circle doing flips and all kinds of uh, footwork and, you know, groundwork, you know what I mean? They would break it down. They would break, uh, you know, the, the sound of the African drums. And from what I mean, I can imagine that also is where like capoeira came from. So the the Brazilian capoeira uh, martial art has very similar dance dance moves to that as well. So anyway, so we get to the 1980s, and you, we have these defined elements now. We got the defined elements of hip hop, the the, the four elements of hip hop, which is b boying, MCing, which is the the rapping aspect of it. Graffiti, which is the visual aspect of it, the the, the graph culture, which is basically b bombing, tagging, you know, basically taking a spray uh, spray can and creating all these very colorful, beautiful works of art, street art, you know what I mean? And they would it would just graffiti tags, whether on the side of a train, you know, uh, on the train stations, on the side of the the, the subway, you know what I'm saying, on, on on a on the side of a wall. In, in some dilapidated building or some kind of uh, some kind of uh, 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 an area that would be gentrified later on you know what I mean so it was basically just this great culture of visual aspect you got the dancing you got it's own, it's got its own slang so hip-hop really became a culture within the East Coast African American community the black community and also influencing the the, the Puerto Rican community as well because they were also they also grew up with it, uh, and then they would get into the, the b-boying, especially with Rocksteady Crew and Crazy Legs and, and those kind of guys. <sighs> and and then you have the DJ culture, which is people like DJ Cole Herc and, and heading into the 1980s and many other DJs coming through, many other uh, uh, DJs that would emerge over the years that would... Th that's the producer. That's the people that create the music people that produce the beats people that create the sound people that would loop the records the dj the probably the most important aspect is the dj because that's where hip hop came from dj cool herc that provided the music which would become this this culture this is hip hop culture but again 
keep in mind that I wasn't there. Being born in 87, all that stuff is something that I learned later on. Over the years, I would watch a documentary or I would read up on the history of hip hop. These things are something that I learned over the years. I wasn't there. I wish I were. I wish I was there back in the, the, the 70s and 80s just to witness it. I would love to travel back in time or be somebody that grew up in that early 70s era when hip hop was just starting. That would have been such a fun time for me. I would have loved to to have been like a, a, a guy from the future, a kid from the future, and bring back like records. Or just like not even bring records, but like beatbox for the first time in front of like the people. Oh, there's another one. Now, g getting into the beatbox aspect of it. Beatboxing is interesting because obviously it has ties to hip hop. It is part of hip hop. But beatboxing is such a, a strange thing because it's not considered one of the elements, but it's 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 like a subgroup of like the the music aspect of hip hop or, or the vocal aspect of hip hop. So it can also it can be a part of MCing because you can have the beatboxer and he he could do the beat for the rapper, and then you have the 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 beat making skills of a beatboxer. So boom. You know, so that was a, a very similar sound to what uh, a, a DJ would produce, the DJ beat maker. So I, I would always, I kind of thought beatboxing as an extension of the the DJ. You know, the producing music, an extension of an extension of that. But as far as the actual history of beatboxing, that is something that I've always been curious about. I've never really delved too much into the, the 80s aspect of it. You know, I've heard of people like a Dougie Fresh, the, the Fat Boys, you know, going as far back as the 80s, and people would have that style of... <laughs> you, you know, that very simple 80s style. But it wasn't until, I would say, until the late 90s where beatboxing really started to get going and become more evolved and become more interesting and become more more common in the mainstream because of people like Razel, Kenny Mohammed, Killa Kella, you know, these guys that influenced the later generations into the 2000s, especially because of the internet. Y'all wanna live my lifestyle Never seen a brick, never seen a crack house <laughs> Steel. <laughs> 
do 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 I gotta get that I'm trying to fit in that little you know that do 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 into it that's a hard one that is a tough one <clears throat> I like the way they call me Big Pop. I like the way they call me Big Pop. Big Pop. Are you ready in the post? Technique, the sunny grits, much when I spit, I spit more casualties. <laughs> Immortal technique, the sunny grits, much when I spit, I cause more tragedies than sunken slave ships. <laughs> Once you, this nigga, his real name was William. His primary concern was making the million. <laughs> Records, records on. Big small if we don't get them, they gon' get us all. I'm down from running the I'm gonna crash from the city hall. <laughs> it's bigger than a bip, a flop, a bip, a bip, a flop, hip, a bip, a flop, a hip. It's bigger than hip, a bip, a flop, a hip, a bip, a flop. This is why I'm This is why I'm This is why I'm hot This is This is why I'm fire So excited, baby. When we're grinding, I get so excited. Ooh, how I like it. Bounce, 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 b
Stupid whistling thing. This, I mean, this goes back in 2005 when he he was battling Faith SFX. I, I, to this day, I never ever figured out how he did that. That high pitched whistling. <laughs> it was like a cronk beat by Little John, you know. He better lay low. But just uh, uh, talking about hip hop itself, you know, and hip hop music is very interesting. Like rap music to me has always been interesting because, as far as like in the 1980s, especially in the early mid 80s, rap was very basic. But then by the mid late 80s, by the mid 1980s, so we started seeing people like uh, Rakim. So Eric B. and Rakim, we started seeing that act. LL Cool J, uh, 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 Big Daddy Kane. So we started seeing KRS One. Uh, we started seeing these more lyrically amazing rappers by the late 1980s, and we started to see more evolution in the rapping style. So they were fast spitting a little bit more. They were spitting a little bit more, more, more uh, 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 intricate lyrics, more complex lyrics, uh, multi-syllabic lyrics, especially with the case of Rakim. So he, 
I, I mean, rap music is interesting because, you, you know, people get into that, into that uh, 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 argument of, oh, who's the best rapper of all time? Well, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest MC of all time? And, I mean, in my opinion, the most influential rapper of all time is Rakim. Because when I was growing up in the early 2000s as a teenager, I would ask people that question, like the older hip-hop heads, and they would all tell me, they would tell me, without Rakim, there would be no other amazing MC because he was the first super rapper. It's like hip-hop was... Hip-hop, specifically rap music, I, I should say rap music itself can be categorized into two different eras and that's before Rakim so 70s early mid 80s rap music and then after Rakim so when Rakim came, Rakim came along hip hop changed forever rap music changed forever because his rapping style was a lot more complicated and a lot more elevated than anything before him so Without Rakim, you wouldn't have Eminem. We wouldn't have B.I.G., Notorious Big, uh, Tupac, uh, uh, Jay-Z, Nas. All these influential rappers, Big L, you know, Big Pun, all these amazing lyrical beasts that we've seen after Rakim, he directly influenced them in some way, shape, or form. Whether it was his swag, his style... Uh, and his lyricism, his flow. He was that guy that would spit like you know, I'm known to uh, uh, I'm known to spit a magnum or split an atom. You know, he was I'm known I'm known to spit a magnum or split an atom. You know. I mean, this dude uh, and the beats. Uh, he had some pretty good, really good beats. The late 1980s was not my favorite era in terms of hip-hop music, you know what I mean? I can't say that in terms of rap music, it was my favorite era of rap, simply because number one, I never grew up in it, and number two, I feel like the beats and the production is very, it's a lot more simplistic, and it, it's, it, it sounds more outdated to me. But that being said, I, I understand how important that late 80s was, because there were so many albums that dropped so many like legendary albums from that era that what what, what would become known as the golden age of hip hop you know i mean again eric b and rock came right i mean G jesus christ you know, thinking of a master plan. You know, great, great, great song too. Um, oh my God. You know, and I bought all those records. You know, what I'm saying I, I copped all those records. You know, what I mean, the Public Enemy, Fear of, of a Black Planet. You know what I mean? I checked out those records. I checked out the uh, Eric B and Rakim. You know what I mean? Uh, paid in full, you know what I'm saying? So I had those records. I really tried to get into the late 80s hip-hop, but just as, as a guy that grew up in the 90s, I preferred the 90s over the 80s hip-hop, just personally. Like, to me, my favorite era of hip-hop would be 93, 93, 94, 95. Those are my three favorite years in rap music overall. And it's like in a row, you know what I mean? It happened to be in a row. 93, 94, 95 in terms of innovation, in terms of amazing lyrics, in terms of great beats. That's my favorite era. And so I, that's about as far as I can go is 93, 94, 95, and then later on, you know. So early, mid-90s, that, that's what I love, but I can't really mess too much around with the, the late 80s hip-hop, even though I understand how influential it was back in the day. And for the rest of, yeah, again, the golden age of hip hop. <sighs> you know, and you have stuff like gangster rap. I mean, gangster rap and gangster rap, I've never really been crazy about gangster rap. You know what I'm saying? Like NWA and all that, and, and having that gangster. I mean, 
I know that Easy called it in an interview. He called it reality rap. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't even like, oh, it's gangster rap. That was more the the mainstream uh, media that would call it gangster rap. But as far as NWA themselves, I, especially Easy E, he called it reality rap. Reality rap, which is talking about violence in in the community, in in the ghetto, in the hood, growing up rough and being messed around with with police and. And, and, and abuse from the cops, gang violence, you know, just living that rough street life. And, and, and but they, they would become a really influential group as far as that, that West Coast gangster, you know what I'm saying, um, mentality of the, the B's and C's, the Bloods and Crips and all that. That was just kind of tied in with the whole gang mentality, the gang culture that... In my opinion, I, I think that whole movement, I was i was never too big into gangster rap. I'll be perfectly honest. I was more into the East Coast style. Like, I liked the East Coast ruggedness and the hardcore rap of the East Coast. All that stuff is cool, but the West Coast felt a lot more... It was just different. It was, uh... I, th I, think, I think it glorified, you know negativity too much so now we're gonna get into the early 90s now we had the influence of the NWA um, and and so they would influence this whole G-Funk East Coast I mean uh, West Coast sorry this West Coast G-Funk gangster funk uh, uh, gangster rap movement and that that high-pitched sound of that really high-pitched noise you know that that's that's very common in like early mid 90s uh west coast g funk rap music you know very common very uh very it, it's a staple it, it became overused and it, you know obviously it became a, a very common sound in, in the west coast yeah people like Nate Dog of course Nate Dog is 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 a legend he became this legendary hook guy singer, you know, rapper. He was just he was the embodiment of G Funk. The G Funk sound. I mean he had that voice and you know it ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. It ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. <laughs> you know, he had that that really silky smooth, like really catchy voice. I I don't even know how to describe it, you know. Do, 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 you know, regulate, right? Oh, my homies, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so by the the early '90s, you had acts like like Tupac, Tupac, Snoop Dogg. You know, they were riding high. They were at riding high. Dr. Dre, uh, on the West Coast. So they were representing the West Side, and they they had this gangster very uh, uh very violent kind of uh swagger to them very very uh laid back very chill but at the same time it it captured that violence it captured that gangster street mentality um that is you know stereotypically seen in in most of uh, 90s rap music so you have people like Dr Dre Dr Dre would become this really successful producer now we get into the influence of, of gangster rap, full-fledged by the mid-90s. So, switching from the, the 80s hip-hop, which was especially the early 80s hip-hop, which was more... It, it, was just, it was just basic rap, you know what I mean? 80s was just basic rap. And most of it, as far as I can tell, was from the East Coast, the New York area. Influenced uh, by, by the New York or Bronx... MCs and people from Queens and you know what I'm saying uh, the, these amazing rappers from the East Coast now we're starting to see a lot of influence in the freaking West Coast in the early mid 90s Pac you know what I'm saying again I mentioned it before uh, uh, Snoop you know the, the the death row the death row records with uh, Suge Knight and uh, uh, Nate Dogg, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of those guys, you know, like BG Knockout and those guys, just a very West Coast G-Funk sound. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 
fucking... I, I can't even... It's it's not even, like, easy for me to beatbox a G-Funk beat. Like, I can't even think of really too many... Because it has a certain sound to it that's kind of almost really high-pitched. You know what I mean? Very high-pitched, very funky, very laid-back. But it's not... You know, like, I'll try to do, like, a Snoop Dogg beat. And it's like, you know, that pump pump sound... You know, it's like the, the, the bass isn't, it's not as hard thumping as the 1980s, like. Style the the 80s style is very like you know it's it's very distinct it has that boom bap sound that boom bap boom boom bap very hard thumping uh very strong kick and drum and snare. But by the freaking 90s, with, with the whole G-Funk sound, it was a lot more about the... That, that, the high-pitched, like, teeny West Coast, high-pitched, like, sound effect. That... <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous. That's not a. That's not any, any specific song either. I just. Uh, I just made up that beat. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of more like Snoop Dogg because you know he had a classic album uh, called Doggy Style back in in I think it was '93, early early '94. Uh, Snoop Dogg, and that was a great album. I really did enjoy Doggy Style. I do think I consider Doggy Style one of the classic. Uh, Hip hop rap albums uh, of all time. You know, there's a lot of great albums in the early '90s that came out. Uh, Enter the Wu by, by the Wu Tang Clan, uh, Thirty Six Chambers, of course, Illmatic by Nas. So we're talking about the East Coast. A lot of uh, great East Coast records, but there was also a lot of cool like alternative rap or uh, alternative hip hop records, stuff from the far side and things like that from the alternative hip hop scene in uh, I guess it's uh, California. You know, Cali, the, the West Coast, they had a little bit of that, uh, it, you know, it sounded a little bit different. It was more, I don't want to say like nerdy or backpacker, but yeah, it was a little bit more introspective. You could say it was more from from a, a, a like I imagine those guys to be students. You know, it's like young college students as opposed to, uh, 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 gun-toting thugs like gangster rappers, you know that stuff wasn't gangster. Like stuff by by Souls of Mischief, you know, and and you know '93 till Infinity and and stuff from the Far Side. That stuff feels very college studentish, very very uh, not even yeah like preppy kind of preppy hip hop or just hip hop for a more suburban type of crowd, you know, like black suburban youth. As opposed to the the street street culture street thug life of the 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 mainstream gangster rap, you know what I mean? So, um, oh my gosh! And so there's a lot of cool records that came out in the early '90s. You all, we we also saw the birth of people like uh, acts like ICP, Insane Clown Posse, and I mean say what you want about the Insane Clown Posse. In my opinion, ICP is the most successful underground hip hop rap act of all time because they generated a lot of money. They became so successful. They their longevity. They've been around since like the early '90s, late '80s, early '90s, and they're still popping. They're still making records. They're still doing it big. They're still, you know, making records, and th they continue to have these. Yeah. Thousand people coming to their shows. They got the gathering of the juggalos that they that, that they have every year. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of people that come out there. Thousands and thousands of people. And they have all kinds of merchandise. And they sold 
a ton of records for an underground rap group. So, I mean, to me, ICP is probably the most successful uh, underground hip-hop group. I mean, I, I really can't think of too many other uh, underground hip-hop rap groups or rap acts as successful as them in terms of maintaining a fan base. We can say, you know, people like Immortal Technique, he, he did really well. Um, you have the independent labels like, uh, you, you know, Lo No Limit, No Limit Records, a Independent. Uh, I believe he was independent. Um, so those guys were successful too, but I mean, I'm, t I'm talking about just like pure, sheer underground, just doing it by themselves. I mean, I know that they had some level of being signed to a major. I believe they were under like they were signed by Hollyweird Records and that was like a part of Disney or something. They got bought up by Disney or something like that. Some crap like that. They, they were a part of Disney or something uh, back in the mid-90s. But they wanted to get out of that. And so they, they, they you know, they, they've been underground since like the early 90s. There's a lot of footage here on YouTube. You know, you can go on YouTube and there's tons of ICP footage from like the, the, the early 90s now where you can see them performing in Detroit doing their thing and it's just so amazing it's like this early 90s like boom bap sound they got that same like boof bow boop boop bow you know bow 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 it's it's just fascinating you know it's it's yeah it's very interesting so i you know got to give credit to ICP whether people hate them or not i mean i don't particularly love their music I like a few of their songs here and there, but it's not, I'm not an expert in, in their music at all. But I, I do respect the fact that they've been able to have such a long, uh, long career in hip hop. You know, they're still ticking, they're still popping. So ICP, you know, they came out of that Detroit early '90s, you know, late '80s, early '90s hip hop scene, and you know, same with guys like Eminem. You know, speaking of the '90s and. Uh, guys coming out of the 80s and early uh, early 90s. Eminem was another guy who's been around since the, the the early 90s. This guy's been rapping since he was like a teenager. Yeah, no. And it took a while for Em to get put on. It took it wasn't until like the late 90s when Eminem got going. But before we get to Eminem, we we got to finish up on the the gangster rap G Funk. So by the mid 90s, I mean gangster rap was popping. So you had people like Tupac, Tupac Shakur, notorious big in the East Coast. You know he was the he was the king of New York, and and Tupac was the king of the the West Coast. They had that big beef. They had that huge feud, and it became this whole East Coast versus West Coast feud that was blown up by the media. Eventually, that became into a thing where Tupac got shot to death. Uh, ninety six, he he was dead in ninety six, and he at that time he was probably one of the biggest selling rappers of all time he was like the hottest rapper at the time he was the kind of guy that he would drop a record and in five months his album would sell like five million copies that's how popular Tupac was you know what I'm saying he would sell millions of records uh, same with Biggie Biggie was a pretty popular rapper too from the East Coast and you and then Biggie would die he, he would end up getting shot to death allegedly because as a retaliation from the Tupac uh, uh, shooting and uh, Biggie ended up getting shot to death in 1997. So these two amazing rappers and very influential, like mainstream rappers of gangster rap and 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 uh, more violent kind of hip hop, they are now dead. And then you have other rappers like like Eazy E. Eazy E is obviously a very important member of of N.W.A. And he was probably the most, I wouldn't say, he, he was the most charismatic, the most, like, memorable guy. Like, his voice was really interesting. He had that, like, kind of high-pitched, like, voice. I can't even, like, imitate his voice. So Eazy e died. Tupac died. Uh, Biggie died. You know, so all these legendary rappers are now dead. So these voices in the hip-hop community are gone they have been ripped away from contributing to hip hop and the hip hop culture no more music from them no more voices from them so biggie's dead tupac is dead easy e is dead uh uh you know Qaddafi. i think Qaddafi is also dead you know what i mean 
So these very, very critically acclaimed MCs and rappers are gone. They are gone. They are dead and never made it out of the 90s. Fast forward a couple of years, we see underground rappers like Big L. You know, Big L is a really, he, he's a great rapper. In my opinion, Big L was the best rapper from the 90s. He's my favorite rapper from the 90s decade is Big L. But by 99, so 1999, year 1999, he was only like in his early mid-20s. I think he was like 24. You know, 23, 24, something like that. The guy is shot to death. Big L dies in 1999. This guy who is probably one of the best freestyler, freestylers in hip-hop at the time, one of the best freestylers, one of the best rappers, one of the most uh, promising rappers. I believe he was going to get signed to Rockefeller Records, uh, uh, Jay-Z's record label, if I'm not mistaken. He was going to get signed to that because, you know, he had connections to Jay-Z and, you know, Jay-Z was on the record with him on on uh, on, on his album uh, Lifestyles of the Poor and Dangerous from the mid-90s. You know, Jay-Z had his, had his rhyme, the way I stop, the way you could drop, stop pop, you know, you know he had that kind of uh, jumbly style back in the day where he would kind of flip the words like, you know, miggity max style, wiggity wax style, you know, he would have, he would have that style uh, back in the day. So by the late 90s, uh, as far as I know, Big L was going to sign to, to Jay-Z's uh, record label. And Jay-Z himself is an East Coast rapper that would become a very influential and highly successful mainstream rapper by the late 90s. I remember Jay-Z's rise to, to, to the mainstream. He had songs like It's a Hard Knock Life, you know, It's a Hard Knock Life for us it's a hard knock life for us you know that that sample from from the annie i think annie from the early 80s the movie it's a hard knock life for us you know he had songs like uh, can i get a you know can i get a f you you know he had the, the 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 snappy beats and they were really kind of nice sounding beats you know he had his beats too were I mean, he had the his first record that I remember was uh, oh oh gee oh, his his first record from oh my god what was it called oh Jesus Lord I forgot his first record was more jazzy it had more jazzy samples to it and it it was a lot more mid ninety sounding you know like from ninety six he had that style that that jazzy funky influence. But by the late 90s, Jay-Z's production started to sound a little bit more like something from, from Swiss Beats or Timbaland or something like that. Like a futuristic late 90s hip-hop beat. Uh, it sounded a little bit more electronic, more produced, and more technologically advanced. You know? Like it was made on on uh, some kind of... Uh, some kind of... Uh, computer program, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that beat, that Can I Get A? Like, I, I can't even beatbox that. I can't beatbox that freaking instrumental because it's so difficult. I can't imitate that, that you know, like, can I get a wah, 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 oh my da, 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 get no, don't, can I get a hoo, 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 you know? I mean, that's just, it's very, di I, I can't even do it. I, I honestly cannot, imitate that because it's so electronic sounding but uh, you know Jay-Z over the years uh, like I said going back to Big L Big L was gonna sign to Jay-Z's freaking label and the thing with Jay-Z's label was th there was promise there you know what I'm saying because he became successful he became a, a big mainstream act so who knows what would have happened to Big L if he hadn't died in 1999 if he signed to Jay-Z's record label, Big L could have been pushed to the mainstream and he could have been a lot more successful c carrying into the early 2000s. You know what I'm saying? But uh, again, that's another voice, another promising rapper taken away from the hip-hop community. So now, by the end of the 90s, so when, when you know 1999 ends and early 2000 comes along, we got people like Tupac, Biggie, Big L, uh, uh, Eazy-E, you know, Gaddafi, these guys are dead. 
these guys are gone these guys are finished they are dead they are gone from hip-hop and then by the early 2000s you see people like big pun big pun is another guy that died in like early 2000 so big pun this guy who is a very critically acclaimed uh, Hispanic rapper he was he's Latino right he's Puerto Rican I think he was the first ever Puerto Rican uh, solo rapper to go platinum you know because he had a bunch of hit records you know what I mean he had a lot of like really good catchy songs you know what I'm saying woo 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 you know uh, still not a player and all that I'm not a player no more Boricua Morena Boricua Morena you know and he, his 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 rapping style was really unique because he he could just rap for like you know you know an hour and it sounded like he he couldn't take a breath he wouldn't he he had amazing breath control you know what i mean his delivery was great and his his style was great his flow was off the chain his 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 lyricism was great he was like a you know what i'm saying he was like a like a machine gun or something like that you know he was just ba 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 Tremendous, tremendous uh, rapper. So, so Big Pun is is dead because of his health issues. You know, Big Pun was a really overweight guy. You know, he he was a fat guy. He was overweight, and he indulged in 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 cholesterol in high saturated fatty foods. You know, what I'm saying he he's the kind of guy that would eat a uh, uh, junk food and 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 you know. Uh, restaurant food, you know, like McDonald's, that kind of stuff, and KFC, I'm sure. You know, whatever it was that he ate, it was basically not healthy for him, and it, he wasn't... I, I don't think he took care of his health enough. So then he... So he's gone. By the early 2000s, the most successful, like, solo Hispanic Latino rapper is, is dead. By the early 2000s. So he's gone. You know what I'm saying? So now you, you you see a pattern. A lot of these rappers are gone, and all and a lot of them tend to be amazing rappers. Big Pun, Big L, Tupac, Biggie, Easy E. All these guys are freaking legends. These are guys are some of the best rappers of all time, and they are dead by the early two thousands. So what are we left with? We still have Nas. Okay, we still got Nas, but Nas. Nas had a great record in the early 90s. He had Illmatic. You know, straight out of the freaking dungeons of rap. You know, when fake gigas don't make it, but you know. And I mean, I love Illmatic. I, Illmatic is probably my favorite single hip hop album of all time. But the problem with Nas was after Illmatic, he had a lot to live up to. And, and by the mid-90s, mid-late 90s, Nas was like, his music was not as well received, you know. So he would come out with Stillmatic and It Was Written and all these other records after Illmatic. But his records kind of were, were, were not as good. They were not as well received. Because, unfortunately for Nas, he set the bar so high with his first album, his debut album, was like a perfect 10 it was like an 11 out of 10, you know? Illmatic was amazing, and then so now, when he puts out an album, they're not as... they're not as good. They're not as dope, and they, they would be like, oh, this album would be like a 7 out of 10, or a 6 out of 10. And they were not as impressive. Even though I personally did enjoy a few of his records after... after uh, Illmatic, you know? Like, uh, you know... Uh, still... Uh, it, it was written, I thought it was dope. You know, so a few of his records was dope after Illmatic. You know, it's not like I, you know, I don't hate his other work after freaking Ill. You know, he, he produced a lot of, he, he has a lot of great songs after Illmatic, but I think his best work was definitely from that early 90s period because just because it was so perfect. Perfect production, perfect samples, great lyricism, uh, 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 great album cover. I mean, the whole thing, it was just a great era. You know, the, the golden age of hip-hop and all that but by the early 90s. So anyway, so Nas was kind of like, eh, whatever, Nas. You know, he, he was dope back in the day. And, you know, he was still around. He was still doing stuff in, in the early 2000s. So Jay-Z, Nas, these guys were sort of the heavyweights at this point. Eminem was one, so we got to get into the Eminem stuff. So Eminem got famous by the late 90s. He got signed by Dre. 
he 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 was a battle rapper before that. He did a little bit of battle rapping uh, back in Jesus, uh, like ninety ninety six ninety seven. I would say Eminem's peak as a battle rapper was 1997. And this is where all that stuff came from, like the, the 8 Mile stuff that would influence every, every freaking wannabe battle rapper around the world. 8 Mile was a movie that came out in, like, two, I want to say 2002? 2002. It came out in 2002. It was loosely based on Eminem's life in the 90s. In the 90s, Eminem was like this underground rapper from Detroit, and he... He came up with that IC, uh, ICP and, and, and Kid Rock and Esham and, and these rappers from the Detroit underground uh, scene. By the mid-90s, I mean, he, he was doing the battle rapping thing. He was in the hip-hop shop with Proof, his, his childhood friend Proof. Uh, rest in peace, Proof. And there's an, a, another great rapper that died uh, uh, too early, uh, Proof. Um, but... So so he had his crew like D12 and those guys right, and and Swifty, Caniva, uh, Bizarre, you know what I'm saying that was his crew in 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 the mid 90s I guess, but he was he was doing the battle rapping thing in the hip hop shop. There, there's footage on YouTube where he's battle rapping against I think it was Swifty, uh, in the hip hop shop. It, it's like from 1996, which is just awesome footage. Um, but by 1997, 97 was Eminem's best year as far as a battle rapper that was his like most prolific year because that's the, the same year that he had he, he went to scribble jam 97 scribble jam was basically this freestyle battle rap competition tournament thing that that started i think from 96 and it would continue until it, it went defunct in 2008 that's when it stopped the, the, the last one was 2008 but eminem was definitely probably the most famous guy to, to compete in the, the scribble jam so Eminem went to Scribble Jam. That was at Cincinnati, I think Cincy, Ohio. Uh, and he, he also did the uh, the the Rap Olympics, the Rap Olympics, uh, 1997, which is like Wendy Day, the Rap Coalition, and all that. And I think he ended up losing to Otherwise. So he loses to Otherwise. So Eminem comes in second place in Rap Olympics '97. He came in second place at at the Scribble Jam '97. Because he lost to Juice at, uh, at the finals. I think he battled Juice like 5,000 times. It's all over YouTube, you know, you guys have seen it. So, Eminem was, he, he was good enough that we, he would get second place. He would get runners up. But he, he never actually won these major events, these big battles. I'm sure he wanted to win. He was a battle rapper. He, he was a gladiator. He wanted to win. But he wasn't good enough to become the winner. He was good. He was, he was one of the top battle rappers in his prime. There's no doubt about that. Eminem was an amazing freestyle battle rapper in 1997. He, he might have been like number two, second best in the world in, in that time. Because again, he second place, Rap Olympics, second place, Scribble Jam 1997. These are big freaking tournaments. He had to battle many, many different people. And all you know, all due respect to Supernatural, Supernat, love Supernat. He he's an amazing freestyler, and all due respect to Juice. You know, all these guys are amazing too. But but Eminem was probably, you know, I, I, again in 1997 he was at the top of his game. He was probably uh, he's got at least the top ten battle rappers of all uh, of 1997 was Eminem. He was in the top ten. So anyway, he paid his dues in the battle rap. He ended up getting signed by Dr. Dre in, in the late 90s, so around 90, 1998, something like that. So he started getting put on in songs. He started getting put on by Dr. Dre. He has a song called My Name Is. Hi, my name is what? My name is who? My name is Tika Tika Slim Shady. You know, that was like his first big record, his, his first hit. I remember seeing that on, on Much Music. And seeing that on TV and just just seeing him, I've never seen like this bleach blonde haired white rapper. He had Dr. Dre as his cosign, his producer. So he had Dr. Dre, this really well respected hip hop producer, behind him, and 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 helping him out, being his his credible like uh, mentor. And then Eminem, you have this young, hungry. 
promising, interesting guy that, that had an interesting voice. He had that nasally sound back then. Hi, kids. Do you like violence? You want me to stick nine inch nails to each one of my eyelids? Do what I did. Try say Get up the worst of my life is. He, you know, he had that nasally high pitched voice, that cartoonish voice. So he, he felt fresh and different, and, and the, the main thing was Eminem could rap. He was a, a, a real MC. He could rap his ass off. This guy was a lyrical rapper. He carried on the, the, the tradition of lyrical MCs like a Rakim and a Nas and, and, and a KRS-One. You know, these guys that would spit. These guys, uh, you know, I'm sure he had influences too, his style, from people like Master Ace. Master Ace is an underground rapper, very well respected. Um, but he just wasn't, you know, Master Ace never really blew up in the mainstream. He never became this huge name, but he, he had a bunch of, like, really good records too. So, Eminem's style was very, very, very late 90s, perfect for the late 90s. His, his delivery, his attitude, his 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 uh his it was like the attitude era you know the attitude era everything was dark or grimy and and offensive you know being offensive that the, the controversial offensive lyrics where he's he's he might say a homophobic homophobic term he got in trouble for that you know th there was um, he, he would say you know f a g g o t you know he would say that word in every single um, not every single one but in many of his records he would say that word and then you have the, the, the GLAAD people and the, the gay rights activist groups. Some of them would go protest Eminem. You know what I mean? Eminem is full of hate. You know, Eminem is full of hate. You know, ban Eminem, ban Eminem. And it's like, th there was a huge controversy around Eminem. He was a very controversial MC f for the late 90s. But that just helped him become more popular. So now you got the mainstream white suburban kids, not just like the the, the black hip hop community, but the the larger white suburban and, and and white America now getting into Eminem because they see this guy, this this young white rapper. He's got the bleach blonde hair, and he's got the uh, he's got the light colored eyes, and he's he's a Caucasian guy. So. To, to say that his race didn't play a part in him becoming famous is just, I think it's ridiculous. You can't dismiss the fact that without Eminem being a really good Caucasian rapper by the late 90s and having that interesting style, but because he's also part, because he's white, I think that's also a part of it. I think that's a fair thing, fair thing to say that he became famous because, part of it, because he was a, a good white rapper. If he had been not white. Let's say he had been an Asian guy, or even a black guy. I'm sure he wouldn't have had the same level of success. It just wouldn't be the same thing. But because Eminem was this, uh, for, for, for the rest of the world, and especially for white countries, the the UK, England, Canada, America, Australia, they saw this mainstream white rapper making it in America and he, he was dope he was lyrically good and he had a lot of good catchy songs so he became a massive star partially because of his race and partially also because of his skill and his talent and him getting put on by this this credible machine behind him Interscope so Eminem worked Eminem worked and it was great, but I, I always felt like as a hip hop as a hip hop head I don't know, he, he was I, he's definitely one of the greatest rappers of all time. I will say that one of the most he, he, I mean he has to be the most successful MC of all time. He's gotta be the most successful, financially successful rapper in history is Eminem. So I can't stress that enough, is Eminem became a very very successful MC, very successful rapper, for sure. Of all time, I, 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 at least in our generation, at least in this generation where I grew up in the, you know, I was born in 87, grew up in the 90s, early 2000s, yada, yada, yada. M my generation, he is the most successful successful rapper, even above somebody like a Tupac or a Biggie 
or a Jay Z or any of those other guys, because he sold he sold a ton of records, he made a lot of money, and people around the world they they buy Eminem, they bought into Eminem, they bought into the hype, they bought into his talent, they bought into the whole thing, and that's you know much respect to M. He was able to do that, but I feel like because of his race. I think a black rapper, or much less like an Asian rapper, or a Latino rapper, a Hispanic rapper, a Mexican rapper, other rappers that are not necessarily white, they're not going to be as successful, even if they have a similar talent to Eminem. You know what I mean? Because that's the demographic. The main demographics of music, mainstream pop American music, is the white suburban demographic because that happens to be the larger uh, uh, population you know what I mean like America is mostly white Canada is mostly white the UK is mostly white Australia and so on and so forth and th that's where these English speaking musicians are marketed predominantly you can say well Jay-Z is very successful around the world and 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 people like uh, you know uh, Tupac is very successful you know even somebody like uh, Kendrick Lamar, you know, Kendrick Lamar is really successful, and Drake, and and you know all these other you know, Nicki Minaj, you know, all these other famous rappers. But Eminem, because the white audience was able to connect to him, just based on what he looks like, his race, his, his him being a talented, amazing white rapper that became successful in the mainstream they were able to buy into him and really enjoy Eminem and really get in get get behind him so to dismiss the fact that he got successful partially because of his race and just dismiss the race part I think that is ridiculous that's that's just asinine that's idiotic you you can't dismiss Eminem's race as a part of why he became successful and so huge because I mean, where are these people to support somebody like Immortal Technique? I, I I love Immortal Technique. You know, I really like both Immortal Technique and Eminem. But Technique speaks about different things. Technique is an underground rapper, and he's very political, and he's he has a bit more more of a darker edge to him. He he's very he's a lot more uh, about politics and and talking about corruption and American corruption. And, and American hypocrisy and all these different things that Eminem isn't necessarily talking about. Eminem is more about a variety of like just Eminem is just M. He talks about his mom, he talked about his daughter, he talks about his beefs, or oh, he's beefing with Benzino, he's beefing with, with, with Ja Rule, all this this this, this hip hop stuff where whereas immortal technique is more about speaking on, on, on a more conscious level. He's he's got more intelligence behind him in my opinion like I pref between Eminem and, and, and Immortal Technique and for anybody that's wondering Immortal Technique is an early 2000s uh, rapper from the East Coast from, from Harlem that's his roots but he he's from Peru he's a Peruvian uh, family from Peru but then they migrated to to uh, New York uh, I should say uh, Harlem I should say Harlem the Harlem uh, East Coast and that's where he grew up during the 80s and early 90s that like, like hip hop was a big thing for for immortal technique but his music is very different his music you know he talks about the war in the middle east he talks about racism he talks about politics he talks about uh co corruption he talks about uh drugs uh the consequences of doing drugs where where cocaine comes from you know he'll have somebody like mumia abu jamal in in his records he'll have uh it's a very political uh, uh kind of like a black power kind of thing you know almost like a his music is in some ways very pro black and i don't want to say his music is necessarily anti white or racist towards white people but i can definitely see a little bit of that, that, that there's a lot of anger there especially in the early his early music revolutionary volume 1 especially uh where he he would have uh kind of uh, these controversial statements 
and people would kind of uh, you, you know they would get offended by it they would get offended by it because he would say the C word and in reference to, to, to Caucasians and white people you guys know what I mean by C word you know, C-R-A-C C-K-E-R you know what I mean he would call certain people like that so he, he was just a very different rapper from somebody like an Eminem whereas Eminem represented he, in many ways Eminem represented the white hip hop community and and successful rappers mainstream rappers immortal technique represents the underground underground MCing underground hip hop and 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 pure hardcore political hip hop and and he represents non whites in in some ways like the non white uh minority he represents hispanics he represents blacks he represents native indigenous people he represents, uh, you know, Asians to a certain degree, and he's just he he's a guy that isn't necessarily catered or palatable to mainstream white America. So by the by the two thousands, you know, what I'm saying like hip hop has become very mainstream thanks to people like an Eminem and and people before him like uh, like a Tupac and Biggie. And, and they were gone, so people like Jay-Z, Nas, these guys that became really, really successful by the early 2000s. And then you have people like 50 Cent, you know what I'm saying? 50 Cent is an, another one, another pet project by, by Dr. Dre and, and the Interscope guys, where, I, I mean, Jesus Christ, 50 Cent was probably the last successful, like, super megastar rapper that, that, that was made through hype and advertising and having that huge machine behind him you know what I mean? I mean his record get rich or die trying which came out like I think it was in 2000 2003 ish 2002 2003 when that dropped I think in 03 that was like the biggest selling album of 2003 it sold like 5 million or 8 million units so that was a huge huge record especially at a time in the early 2000s where everything was becoming downloaded uh, on the internet and that's an, another big factor in, in hip hop's downfall so now we, we see this huge increase in hip hop uh, sales people like Eminem Eminem was selling millions of records you know by, by the early 2000s 50 cents selling millions of records I mean in the 90s you had people like Tupac and Biggie that, that would sell millions but by the late 90s early 2000s Eminem Jay Z, you know, uh, Fifty Cent. These guys were still selling millions, but because of the internet and 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 downloading piracy and all that music piracy, downloading MP3 music. Now you can download music for free for, for, from Kazaa and LimeWire and and Napster. By the early 2000s, so we're talking about 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, especially by by 05, 05, 06 rap record sales started decreasing and they just kept decreasing and decreasing and decreasing to the point that nobody could sell people can barely sell a million units you know in 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 the 90s especially like uh you know mid late 90s people could sell like a million two million and that would be no big deal it would be like oh yeah yeah i sold a, i went platinum you know it sucks, you know. The the, my, the the major label was disappointed. I didn't I didn't go three times platinum, but I uh, you know I sold uh, two million. You know, couldn't sell three million, but I sold two million. You know, you know it it was okay. But by the mid two thousands, selling a million, going one time platinum was that that was a big deal by itself. That's like holy crap! How'd you do that? Because everybody's downloading now. And people were getting sick and tired of rap music too. By by the early two thousands, rap music had become in, in, incredibly stupid and dumbed down. It become it became incredibly idiotic. It started to sound a lot more more catered towards a really stupid audience. Because by we're talking about thirty years of hip hop history. At this point, we're talking about from the early seventies. And then early 80s, early 80s, that's 10 years, early 90s, 20 years, and then early freaking 2000s. So 2003, 2004, 2005, we're talking about three decades of hip-hop now. And, and rap music has, 
has become so commercialized and mainstream that it's it, the, the only thing that they talk about is I got I got bitches, hoes, uh, platinum chains, iced out medallions, bling bling. That was that was a big one. That's where you know the bling bling era that came from the late 1990s, late 90s, the bling bling era. Uh, and part of the reason why the bling bling era came out, we, the bling bling thing came from. I have flashy jewelry. I have flashy jewelry on, on my on my on around my neck. So so platinum chains, gold chains, you know, diamonds, all that crap, that flashy bling blingy crap, gold fronts or, or platinum fronts, you know, the, the the grill, the iced out grills, iced out medallions, having excess, having tens of thousands of thousands of dollars worth of stupid, worthless, pointless dumb jewelry around this freaking guy's neck and having that braggadocio look at me I'm a pimp I'm a hustler you know I'm I'm flossing I'm flossing you know I got bitches in the living room I got hoes everywhere you know having talk you know you got a rapper talking about how much money he has how how many hoes he has how many drugs he sold you know kind of like this this post scarface you know wannabe scarface from the early 1980s, you know, wannabe Tony Montana kind of lifestyle where, you know, these rappers are basically, they're doing the whole Rakim gimmick. Rakim has the chains from the early 90s, you know, Don't Sweat the Technique and all that, where, where he, he's in the Don't Sweat the Technique video where he's got the iced out chains and all that crap, the the, the gold chains, I should say, with the, with the half-naked women dancing in the background, but they the mainstream took it to a, another level where everything is like that every rap record instead of being interesting or being intelligent has become so goddamn stupid it was all about excess it was all about materialism it was all about how much money you had or how many bitches you've had or how many drugs you've sold or how, how big is your mansion and your your fancy yachts your fancy cars it was all about that by the late 90s by like 97 98 99 guys like Jay-Z people like Master P Puff Daddy because you know after the death of the, the gangster rap Tupac dead Biggie dead all those guys Easy E dead the gangster rap hyper violent sound of the the early mid 90s changed into a more materialistic thing where now we're not going to talk about you know killing each other and shooting guns and stuff we're, that's going to be less less focus on that and more focus on how much iced out medallions i have how many bitches i have how 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 many cars i have how many hoes i've been with all that stuff how how much how many millions and millions of fake fictional dollars i have in in my bank account you know what i'm saying so that that was the late 90s pimp era bling bling era of hip hop it was all, it became really, really stupid. So by the early 2000s, I mean, guys like Eminem really weren't talking about that. Eminem was a little bit different. But, you know, people like Jay-Z, Jay-Z would talk about that. And Snoop Dogg and Pharrell, you know, Pharrell Williams. And a lot of these guys from the early 2000s, it was just nothing but excess. It was all about, like, bitches and hoes and all that stuff. That, that was hip-hop in the early 2000s, all the way from people like Eve and Bubba Sparks and the Rough Riders, all these guys. You know, the the, the Dipset, that's another one. Dipset was another perfect example. Uh, Joel Santana and all those guys. Oh, of course, 50 Cent was another one where 50 had a bit of that, he had like a mixed gimmick. You know, his gimmick was partially, he was a gangster, a, a, a post-90s, uh, gangster kind of guy, but he also had the excess. He talked about bitches. He talked about hoes. He talked about candy stick and and, and the candy shop. You know, he talked about how much, uh, how 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 much he's flossing. You know, music for for like little kids. Like it was just dumb club music. So, by the mid two thousands, rap had become completely stupid in the mainstream. The underground was still dope. Like underground hip hop was still doing good. It, it had people like Immortal Tech and and, and TRP, Enemy Records, and uh, 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 the Def Jux guys, the guys from Def Jux, and people like Cage, and uh, you had people like Tone Deaf and people like uh, 
uh, th there was a lot of great underground rappers Deltron 303030 uh, and uh, Cannibal Ox you know many different amazing underground stuff but they were not as commercially successful they, they simply were not as relevant in the mainstream they, they weren't making as much money and they, they weren't as given uh, as much exposure you know so people like Brother Ali and Diabolic and you know Apathy all these guys were just kind of they were just underground guys that maybe had a few thousand followers a few thousand maybe you, you know less than a hundred thousand people that knew about them you know what I mean uh, so by by the mid 2000s the mainstream rap had become so saturated with excess flossin bling bling how much money you had all that garbage so 2005 2006 there was a drastic change so all that stuff started to kind of die down a lot of those guys started to disappear so people like Ludacris started to disappear Ludacris was a perfect example of a, a, a mainstream rapper in the early mid 2000s that was all about the bitches and hoes and how many how much stuff he has you know everything was about excess uh, him uh, about him uh, Nelly was another one Nelly another perfect example of a very materialistic bling blingy type of rapper from the early 2000s so Nelly Ludacris uh, those were some of the main guys Dipset you know what I mean 50 Cent these guys started to fade away by the mid 2000s by 05 06 the, the, the not the demographics but the style was changing a little bit where you could see the rapper starting to become a little bit more uh, a little bit more non-interesting it was just like ah rap sucks now you know what I mean by 06 you had people like I you know TI was still kinda relevant TI was still having records uh, TI you, you know he had the trap music and he was largely responsible for giving a lot of popularity to what you know this modern trap stuff that we see now like trap EDM which was based on trap hip-hop music well he had a lot of that trap style he, he he used trap music as his main like gimmick you know what I mean his album was called trap music so that southern style you know what I mean TI was one of those guys and then no, no, we started to see other guys emerge people like Lil Wayne by the mid 2000s 06 07 people like Rick Ross started to emerge you know so now we started to see this this southern movement like the, the south blew up around 05 06 it really really became huge people like Chameleonaire and Lil Wayne and and you know TI and and uh, just a ton of like southern rap oh, who was the other guy the, the, the white guy Paul Wall there's another another guy from the early, uh, from the mid 2000s Paul Wall had some hit records in the mid 2000s as a white rapper but he had like that southern flavor he had the grills in his teeth and all that and he had that southern I, I don't even know what you call it like a like a like a crunkish or trappish kind of style I don't I can't even describe it just uh, just the southern flavor to it I don't know so by the late 2000s, now we're getting into like 2007, 2008, 2009, most of the East Coast and the West Coast has kind of fallen off and died and kind of just beca became irrelevant. There's not as many artists there that became as, as famous because people were sick and saturated of, they, they were tired and done with the gangster rap of the West Coast and they were tired of the, the East Coast's uh, obsession with bling bling and how much money you have. This, this excess, this, this you know talking about how many chains you have and how many hoes you've been with so the south kind of took over and became like this 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 influential kind of scene where you have people like Wayne and you know TI where the, the style and the production was also very different and it was a little bit more snappish and it was a little bit more it sounded different it had a kind of a, a snappy you know the the beats were hidden differently it, it just sounded different the, the the patterns were different you know I, I don't necessarily think it was amazing but it sounded different you know I don't necessarily think like oh that uh, you know 
you know, Chameleon Air was this amazing rapper, or, or Paul Wall was amazing, because none of those guys were amazing rappers, but their beats were really, really catchy. They had these producers that, that, that produced these really slick, snappy beats that sounded different from the typical East Coast uh, kind of uh, j jazz, funky kind of beats and, and samples of the East Coast. And, you, you know, they sounded kind of dry, you know, a little bit dry. And then the West Coast had the, the old, tired, kind of G-Funk sound, you know, the... That, that was kind of done, too. So the, the Southern stuff was more like... You know, it had a little bit more of a kick to it, like a, like a weird, slick flavor to it. It's like somebody punching you and kicking you in the teeth kind of thing. You know, it was just kind of rugged. It had a it had a almost like a metallic sound to it, a, a metallic, gritty sound. You know, it's, uh, and that's where like trap EDM came from, uh, influencing the trap electronic dance music. That's where you know stuff like like the crunk music, you know, the crunkish vibe. You know what I mean? Has that southern flavor, and then that would also influence like the Midwest and stuff like that. People like Kanye West. Oh, Kanye was another really successful producer. Uh, rapper from from the 2000s, you know. I remember when Kanye started blowing up in in as a as a solo act. You know, he was a producer for a long time. He produced for people like Jay Z and stuff like that. Um, but he he became successful solo by like the by 2003 2004. He had like college dropout, you know, late registration by the mid 2000s. So he had a bunch of records that was really successful. And, and he had that Midwest flavor that was kind of, uh, uh, again, the beat sounded a little bit different. You know, not in, in a crunkish, southern, trappish kind of way, but in a, in a more, they, they sounded a little bit more uh, uh, just interesting. They, they sounded new, they sounded fresh, they, they used different samples and styles and sounds. It, it just hit differently, that, that Midwest 2000s flavor. Uh, especially by people like Kanye West. Um, so by the late again by the late freaking two thousands, now hip hop has become super saturated. It's become complete freaking just utter stupidity. You know, it it become a lot more basic. But but in terms of beats, in terms of production, now rap music has become incredibly. Uh, it's become. It, it sounds good by beats. The, the beat sounds a lot more advanced, but the rapping style was just... It, it's, it's, it's a lot more stupid than it's ever been. It's a lot more basic. It's, it's a lot more simplistic. It's a lot, it's a lot less interesting. It was just the same typical, I got hoes, I got bitches, I got all this excess, but now we're, we're, they're rapping, doing like the Migo style, they're rapping kind of like how Tech 9 used to rap back in, in the early 2000s, but it's like weirdly influenced by, by, by Lil Wayne, you know what I mean, who, who got his, his, his style from, uh, from Gilly. Gilly was basically this, this, uh, this rapper that, he was kind of an unknown rapper, not, you know, not a lot of people know about him, but Gilly, I think it's Gilly the Kid, Gilly the Kid influenced Lil Wayne's rapping style, you know. Um, so, Lil Wayne, in turn, became one of the, the, the best-selling rappers of the late 2000s. I think it was the best-selling album of 2008, you know, so that was like nine years ago. But he had that uh, Carter Three. The, the Carter Three sold a lot of records, and he was successful for that time. So his style, his rapping style, became common, and everybody wanted to kind of imitate it and, 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 and mimic it. So people like Drake... And, and Mad Child from Soul and Members, just about everybody wanted to sound like, like a like a Lil Wayne style. So by the late two thousands, you had everybody trying to mimic that Lil Wayne bullcrap. And then by the by the early, uh, by, by the early twenty tens, now you have an even more dumber version of hip hop rap music, which is. And, and rap record sales have become a lot lower than it, they've ever been. Nobody is selling as much as they, they, they used to in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know. The only guy that was selling in the early 2010s, I think, was, was Eminem. Eminem, he, he had, I think, Recovery. He dropped Recovery, I think, in that time. And he, ha he had a pretty strong uh, record sales. But it's, it's Eminem. He's a very established guy.
for many years, Eminem kind of fell off, you know? After, like, the mid-2000s, he kind of just... He wasn't as as good as he used to be, and then Re- Re- Recovery was kind of a, a decent record, so he sold a pretty good amount of records. Um... And and then now we're gonna get into the the, the early early mid 2010 so 2000 2011 2012 2013 2014 2015 now we're starting to see trap become really popular which is the trap southern style which kind of became a very common style it, it just be, took over the migos flow the trapping beats the the People like uh, the, the Chicago Drill, people like Chief Keef. Chief Keef became really popular in, in like 2011 or 2012. You know what I mean? His his style, his drill music, this Chicago Drill music, which is really, really like, uh, kind of like a gangsta type of uh, rap music, but but with influences from the South, with influences from from that trappish crunkish style you know the Chicago drill music I mean you could technically say oh it's kind of like gangster rap because they talk about violence and 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 guns and 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 you know that kind of gang lifestyle especially reflecting Chicago's uh, violent uh, gang culture in Chicago you know Chicago is a very violent area right especially in in the 2000s you know all the shootings and, and and the gangs and the the gang violence and all that stuff people like chief keef this guy you know he had that record uh, I, I don't like you know i don't like that's the ish i don't like uh, ish, uh, that's the ish i don't like you know a uh, 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 a snitch hitter that's the ish i don't like i don't like you know what i mean that became like a really popular and it was really stupid like really dumb lyrically just a dumb, idiotic record. You know what I mean? It was just so stupid. But it worked because it sounded different. The, the beat the beat was different. The lyrics was very simple but catchy. And it was just dumb. And I, It was just this, this modern drill music of the early 2010s. I mean, now we don't really know anything about Chief Keef. Chief Keef is just kind of... He's kind of done. He's just irrelevant in, in 2017, you know. I haven't really heard about him in, in like five years. But... He's just, he was very successful in that 2011-2012 period. And then after that, you know, in the 2013, 2014, 2015, people like Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj started popping, popping off, and her music was popping off. She started sampling old records, you know, like Anaconda and stuff like that. So now we started to see a little bit of the 90s influence into, into rap music. They started sampling stuff from the 90s people like uh you know Nicki Minaj and and other rappers like uh like Chris Rivers you know what I mean started sampling some old stuff Style Speed starts sampling old stuff people like uh like Yuckmouth starts sampling the older 90s records you know what I mean but at the same time rap music is just kind of done in 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 the 2010s you know, in, in 2017, I'm just not that interested in, in rap music and hip-hop music. It, it just isn't the same. It doesn't have the same innovation. It's not as interesting as it used to be. It's not as dope as it used to be. It's not as fresh as it used to be. It doesn't have the intelligence. The only rappers that I still listen to is... is Sometimes I'll still listen to an Immortal Technique song. So I'll bump an, an old Immortal Technique song I used to listen to when I was in high school from like 2003, 2004, you know? I mean, he's, he has some newer records. He had like the, the Third World and The Martyr and stuff like that. But even like The Martyr is like six years old now, you know? The Third World came out, I think, in like 2008. So that, that stuff goes back like nine years ago. So Immortal Technique, he, he's been around for a long time too. So there's really no new rappers that I can look at and go, wow, that guy is amazing. You know, guys like, you know, Kendrick Lamar, he's okay. You know, Drake, I'm not really a big fan of Drake. I like a couple of his songs, you know. Stay scheming, it is trying to get at me. Do, 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 do. And, you know, that song's pretty old now, but, you know, I kind of like that. Uh, started from the bottom. I, I do enjoy Started from the Bottom a little bit. New, 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 new. Started from the bottom now, we started, started from the bottom. Then my whole team up in here. Yeah, 
So now in 2017, I mean, rap music has largely become like this idiotic, just dime a dozen, everybody sounds the same, everybody's doing trap music or some kind of cloud rap, you know, boring rap. It's, it's all like really boring, people like Lil Yachty. Uh, who the hell is Lil Yachty? This guy sucks. His music sucks. Lil Yachty is boring to me. Because his music isn't interesting. A lot of these guys suck. You know, people like Rich Homie Kwan and 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 Two Chains and all these guys. You know, they, these guys suck. These modern rappers today are garbage. They're nothing like the the, the nineties records, the nineties MCs and, and people like Nas and, and, and Big L. Like those days are over. We don't we don't have people like that anymore. We don't have like those amazing MCs back in the day that cared about lyricism. They had great beats, they had great samples. Now everything just sounds like a a generic cloud cloud rap instrumental or some kind of trap instrumental. Everything is cloud or trap. You know, or some kind of uh mumble rap. That's that's the one, mumble rap. That's the big one now. Mumble rap. Oh my god, mumble rap. How how garbage. Talk about trash. So of course hip hop has died and rap music has died. Because nobody cares anymore. Like hip hop has completely fallen off. There's no more M&Ms, there's no more Tupacs, there's no more Biggies. You take a look at like 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 a Tupac interview and he's so intelligent and he's so interesting and he's such a idealistic guy and he's got so many ideas but but this guy was like way ahead of his time in terms of intelligence he seemed a lot older than he was you know Tupac like the closest thing to a Tupac would be like Immortal Technique and Technique he's been around a long time and he's 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 a veteran now but we don't really have people like that anymore. We don't have any intelligent rappers in the mainstream. We don't have any interesting rappers. Everybody sounds the same. So, of course, rap music sucks now. And hip-hop is pretty much dead. So, you know, the, the internet had a lot to do with it, of course, because it killed the record sales. But rap music started to suck completely because of people like P. Diddy and Master P and Jay-Z to a certain extent because all they talked about was bling bling and how much money they have and how many bitches that they that they messed with and how many trillions of dollars they have the, these fake fictional crap that they have they're flossing they got iced out medallions I got bitches I got hoes you know all that garbage and then that morphed into what we see today with the, with the trap stuff and, and, and the cloud rap and, and the mumble rap it's the same garbage it's just that it's a little bit more southern influence but they're talking about the same stupid garbage you know we don't have the intelligence we, we don't have any more public enemies we don't have any more rock hymns that, that want to like elevate lyricism not even el not want to elevate lyricism but like have that innovation I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, that that's it. I mean, I've been rambling about like the death and the rise and fall of hip-hop. I know I, did, I didn't do a lot of beatboxing in this one, so I apologize for that. But I just wanted to talk about basically the death of hip-hop. I just wanted to talk about it. I really did. I just wanted to focus on why hip-hop is dead. Because hip-hop killed itself. Mainstream rap destroyed itself by producing garbage. And when you produce garbage music, nobody's gonna give a crap. I know I don't. I stopped giving a crap about rap music a long time ago. The only rapper that I still listen to now is Immortal Technique from the early 2000s. That's it for this episode of The Review Space. Check out the channel for more videos. Until next time, peace.